I would first of all like to thank Marsha and Ruth and Pastor John and all of you um, for joining us today for this opportunity to share um, a bit about um, an Islamic perspective um, on the question, um, what holy books or other texts are important to your religion? Um, I had mentioned to Marsha not too long ago that I thought this question could be interpreted in a number of ways. Um, but I'm going to answer it um, the way that it that um, it appeared to me. Um, I'd like to start off maybe by taking a step back and discussing um, the nature of revelation in the Islamic tradition. Um, so revelation, when we when we say that something um, constitutes scripture, we don't mean necessarily sacred history or um, history about something that was sacred. Um, but rather we mean uh, direct communication from God, from the divine, um, through the intermediary of an angel. Um, and so when you talk about revelation, you have to understand what a prophet is. So they, the revelations or scriptures are revealed to prophets. Um, not all prophets bring scriptures, uh, a divinely revealed book, um, but they all receive revelation of different types. They're inspired or they're told or they're taught. Um, through the intermediary of an angel. Now, I'm going to be framing this conversation through the Qur'an. Now, some of you may or may not know, the Qur'an, we believe, is God's um, final revelation to humanity. Um, we believe the Qur'an to be the literal word of God verbatim, so not something that the Prophet Muhammad uh, was inspired with, or some, you know, he, the meaning was brought to him and, and, and he selected the words, but rather he relays or faithfully conveys the literal word of God. Um, and so according to the Quran, um, there are you know, very clear verses that state that all peoples were given guidance by God. Um, they were all sent a messenger. Um, and the messages um, had one unifying theme, which is essentially um, what would be encapsulated in the Arabic statement, la ilaha illallah, that there's nothing worthy of worship besides God, that you wouldn't put any partners um, next to God, and then therefore you would live your life in accordance with that. But the edicts or the law um, changes with times and with peoples. And so you, you could find in some scripture or some pr uh, previous um, dispensations, the rulings might have been different according to law, and then a different prophet would come in and, and bring a different law. Um, but the, the fundamental message, or particularly as it pertains to belief, uh, would be the same. It would be unifying, which is that God has sent me, worship um, no one besides God, um, and you know, uh, you know, there, there will be judgment and, and sort of act accordingly in various ways. Um, but I, I do think there is one statement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that I think it really encapsulates how um, Islam sees other texts or other scriptures or other religions for that matter. Um, and it's a statement from the Prophet Muhammad in which he says, and I'm, I'm, I'll just read the text um, to quote it. He says, verily, the parable of myself and the prophets before me is that of a man who built a house, he perfected it, then he beautified it, except for the place of one brick and the cornerstone. So, you know, the cornerstone is it's obviously a, uh, you know, this, this well-known, it's, it's the cornerstone of the home, it's missing one brick. So the people, to continue the quote, the people walk around it and are amazed by it. And they say, why is this brick not placed? Thus, I am the brick and I am the seal of the prophets. And that's the end of the quote. The reason I think this is um, such an encapsulating summary is in the Islamic tradition, the Prophet Muhammad's mission is not to demolish this previously built house or to replace it, but to complete and restore the succession of bricks. I mean, that he is the final brick. He's, he's the, uh, he says that I am the seal of the prophets and tells us that um, none will come after him. Um, and so one of the things that, that Islam is very clear about in the Quran is it affirms prophets before the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. One verse, which is oft quoted, um, states, Indeed, we have sent revelation to you, O prophet, as we sent revelation to Noah and the prophets after him. And we also sent revelation to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and his descendants, as well as Jesus, Job, Jonah, Aaron, and Solomon. And to David, we gave the Psalms. So you can see here that one cannot accept the Quran 
um, without affirming the prophethood of all of these prophets. And, uh, and obviously some of these manifest into different religious communities as well, um, but, but we affirm them. So the Quran uh, frames itself as the final revelation in this Judeo-Christo-Islamic tradition, right? Um, and, it, and it sees the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a restorer of the way of Abraham. Um, but it also, so it definitely, it definitely emphasizes the Abrahamic way, but it also accepts the possibility of other unspecified religions. Um, because we're told that every people were sent a prophet in their own tongue. So um, yeah, scholars of, of the Islamic tradition have said, you know, clearly that means that they were prophets sent to all of the continents and all of the peoples and all of the languages. Um, and perhaps some of these religions that remain today um, were originally, e even if, if, if they have changed, they, they were sourced um, or, or they were uh, based on an original source that, that had a divine, um, uh, had a divine uh, source to it. And so when it comes to other scriptures, the Quran has a very honorable uh, epithet called Ahl al-Kitab, the people, sometimes translated as the people of the book. Some of you might be familiar with that. Um, some of you may have heard that phrase. Um, it might also be translated as the people of the Bible, um, because of the book, Biblios, um, be, meaning the book. And so the Quran specifies uh, two main revelations, the Torah, which is the Torah, and the Injil, which is the gospel or the Evangelion. You can see Injil and Evangelion sort of share, they have some similar cognate, uh, but in the singular. And so the Quranic narrative um, states that the original unaltered texts, and not, not to be polemical, but I'll get into that shortly, but the original texts that serve as the foundations for, for parts of some of the current Bible did indeed come from God, and, and in them is truth, and, 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 and as a believer, a Muslim has to um, affirm that. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting is that the Quran doesn't detail um, how they were preserved or passed down, but simply states that uh, it, it was quite common um, as a, in, in human history for people to alter uh, messages as time went on. Um, so the Quran affirms their divine origin. I think another thing that's very interesting is that in the Quranic narrative, um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's foretold in both the Bible, but uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Bible. So like in Isaiah and Deuteronomy, references to, to Shiloh and the paraclete, things like that. There's, there's uh, passages that according to a Muslim interpretation uh, would foretell the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Ishmael's line. Now, why is that important? Is I think it does uh, make very clear to, to um, anyone who's either Muslim or at least studying Islam that these books are not to be... Um, dishonored or to be you know disgraced or to be denigrated um, but simply that they that the Quran comes uh, to confirm their divine origin um, and also it uses a term that's called the, the muhaymin so the Quran serves as the overseer of or the or the um, authority over other scriptures now why is this the case the Quran we're told by God has a unique quality amongst the revelations, the revelatory scriptures. And that is that the Quran was promised a divine preservation, that it would be protected from alteration because it's the final scripture and there would be nothing else to, to sort of set the record straight. Um, and so the Quran is in conversation with the other scriptures. Now, what do I mean by that? If the Quran affirms the divine origin of other scriptures, um, but disagrees on proper conceptions of God, definitions of the oneness of God, who was the person of Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. Um, it allows for their divine origin, but it definitely takes positions on these questions. And so although, you know, Muslims are told to leave people to their beliefs, it does engage in sort of an interfaith dialogue um, that would say, for example, it affirms Jesus as the Messiah, which I, I, I hope many of you know, right? Um, but would say that he was not um, God incarnate, for example. And so there, there you have 
um, one disagreement with, with the Jewish tradition, um, followed by a disagreement with some of the, the, the Trinitarian Christian tradition. So there's this respectful dialogue and engagement that, that ensues. One of the reasons I think this is important is I think it does give us a way of learning about um, and interacting with and getting to know our neighbors. And I think one, one verse really highlights this. Um, there's a verse um, in the Quran in which God states, and again, we believe whenever we, we read the Quran that this is God's words. That he's speaking. These aren't the words of the prophet Muhammad. He simply conveys them. But God says, we have revealed to you, O prophet, this book with the truth as a confirmation of previous scriptures. So I think that I want to sort of highlight that confirmation of previous scriptures and a supreme authority over them. So the reason that, that, that the authority aspect is to, to verify the veracity and where there is a difference, the Quran will, will sometimes uh, correct an understanding that, that, that is uh, deemed to be mistaken. So then this is continuing the, 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 the verse. So judge between them by what God has revealed and do not follow their desires over the truth that has come to you. Now, this is the important part, I think. To each of you, we have ordained a law and a way of life. If God have willed, he would have made you one community. But his will is to test you with what he has given each of you. So God tells us that even, you know, even as a believer, even as a Muslim, that nobody, none of us will ever be all one religion. That's just the... the, the the human story, for whatever divine wisdom, is more complex than that, um, is, is richer than that. There's, there's some divine wisdom here. So he says, for each of you, we've ordained a code of law and a way of life. If God have willed, he would have made you one community, but his will is to test you with what he has given each of you. So compete with one another in doing good. So what we're told as religious communities in the Quran is you're going to differ. You're going you're gonna to debate, you're, you're, you're going to end up in different positions, but compete with one another in doing good. That's, that's what we should really be competing in. And then the rest of the verse reads, to God, you will all return, and he will inform you of the truth regarding your differences. Meaning you're not going to be able to sort it all out here. God sent a succession of prophets. The, there's a confirmation of the divine origin, which I think allows a common ground. Um, there's a verse in the Quran that I think is also important here, particularly for the Abrahamic tradition, which says, if we differ with one another, let's just go back to Abraham. We can all agree that Abraham was on the right path. So that's why even, even the phrase, the Abrahamic traditions, takes us to the point of the most common ground, which I think is a, is a place in which we can develop some understanding. Um, and wherever we respectfully agree to disagree, um, that's, that's at least um, a shared foundation. Um, so the Quran encourages this interfaith dialogue, this respectful coexistence, um, while also maintaining you know, very clear positions on you know, conceptions of God and, and, the, and, and prophets and divinity of, of, of people, um, you know, or sorry, the lack of divinity of, of, of any particular prophet. Um, so I think this sort of encapsulates how we view things um, as a religion. Um, and the, the Quran is very specific about these two, the, the Torah and the gospel, um, the, that the original scriptures are from God. And they're, they're more de there are more detailed verses that say in them is light and guidance. And if people follow them, then, then, then they, will, you know, they will find um, success, etc. Um, but I think that even how we view human history is really impacted by this. So, for example, in the Islamic tradition, we don't hold that before the advent of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that the world was simply in darkness. And until he came, then, you know, everybody just was, was lost. Um, what we would say is it was that, that parable of, of the house being built brick by brick. Um, and there was an incompleteness and an imperfection until that last cornerstone was placed. Um, and and uh, that is what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, completes. Um, and there are many, many other traditions um, in which you know, we affirm all of what might be called biblical prophets, but even prophets that are outside of the biblical scriptures as well. Um, and then to accept or entertain the possibility of, for example, Native American prophets or what would be considered you know, Asian prophets and African prophets and European, you know, from, from all over. Um, with, with a clear acknowledgement 
that the Abrahamic prophets um, have have a have a uh, a special status and make a mark on the world, um, unlike the others. So I think I'll stop here, um, and I hope that wasn't too much. I tried to keep it um, sort of high, you know, high level, more conceptual, not get lost in obscure theological um, things, and, and really trying to avoid anything polemical, um, but just hoping to convey my understanding of the Islamic view of other scriptures. So I think um, maybe, Marsha, if we want to open it up for questions, now would be a good time. Yes, perfect time. Okay, so please either raise your physical hand or um, use the reactions uh, with the raise hand icon. And I will call on you. Questions. Ramona, I, th I see your hand raised. Um, so Ramona, you're going to unmute. And could everybody else who's not currently speaking, um, please mute yourselves. And Ramona, go ahead, please. Um, Dr. Tarzan, thank you so much for all of this, all of what you said. I mean, I was saying, wow, I didn't know so much <laughs> of, of all the information you gave us. You uh, the way I understood it, you said that every people was sent a prophet in their own tongue, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, ma'am. And this was based on a divine source. Does that include the Eastern religions, um, the, the Hindus, the Buddhists, or only the Abrahamic? You know what I'm, um, yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think what we can say is the only ones we can specify with certainty and point to and say this had a divine source are the ones that God outlines in the Quran, which are primarily the Abrahamic faiths. Okay. But we can entertain the possibility and say, well, we do know that there were other prophets sent to all peoples in their native tongue. That doesn't have to be a scripture, but people who are divinely inspired to go and call people to God um, and tell people about God. Um, and so we can, we can probably, what we can say is we can um, have theories about the divine sources, um, but we would probably just put a small asterisk. You know, there's many scholars who said that Buddhism um, and Hinduism probably have a divine origin. Um, Islam is very monotheistic, radically monotheistic. So the current understandings of these religions, we would say, we're not what, you know, you know, to have any type of polytheism or multiple gods or even godheads. And those things we would say are, are human additions later. But if we're talking about the origins of the teachings, mm -hmm. um, many scholars of Islam would say, yeah, we can, we can theorize that they, that, that was likely the case. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else with a question? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I, I have a question uh, for Dr. Okay. Yes, <clears throat> yeah, we see a lot of, uh, in the Quran, we see a lot of verses relates the interaction of uh, Christians, specifically from Ethiopia uh, with Prophet Muhammad and verses revealed about them, uh, like they are kind-hearted or, uh, can you like shed some light on those? Yeah. Um, there are, there are many verses and it doesn't simply apply to, well, let me maybe give a little bit of history. So, um, the, the prophet Muhammad, uh, was sent to a polytheistic people. Um, and when he started to call to the God of Abraham and to monotheism and, and called for them to do away with the idols, um, you might imagine that, that there was a lot of, um, oppression, um, and persecution. Um, and so much so that many of his followers began to, you know, suffer great torture at the hands of, of, of the, the, the tribal leaders who, who uh, profited greatly off of this, this uh, idolatry. Um, and so some of them, um, the Prophet Muhammad commanded them to migrate to Ethiopia, modern day Ethiopia it was, it was uh, Abyssinia at the time, because he said there is a just Christian king there. And there you will see no harm and, and you'll be able to sort of enjoy freedom of religion. Um, and so that, that, that happened. Um, and there was always a great affinity um, between um, 
you know, the Prophet Muhammad and, and, and some of the Christian communities there. But I think some of the verses that you're talking about is, is that, you know, there are many verses praising the, not just Christianity as a, uh, as a, as a, uh, as a tradition or a dis- religious dispensation that, that truly came from God, um, but also that the Christian community were, um, was filled with people who truly loved God and were pious um, and whose tears would overflow, you know, whose eyes would overflow with tears at the mention of God um, and the great piety and support and love that, that they would experience from some of them. So, um, yeah, that, that, that was definitely there in the Quran and, and sort of historically. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Saad. My pleasure. Talk. Very interesting. Um, Ruth, I'm going to suggest we go ahead with Pastor John. And then if there's still time left before we're ready for our breakout groups, if some people thought of some additional questions, um, we could take them at that time. Does that sound okay? Absolutely. That's great. Okay. Okay, Dr. Uh, no. Reverend, what is it that I'm calling you today? <laughs> Reverend or pastor? You can call me whatever, just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> You're on. <laughs> I, I appreciate Dr. Tarson's PhD. I'm still paying off my master's student loans <laughs> at this point in time. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll believe it when I see yeah. Um we um thank you thank you ruth and marcia and, and dr tarson to to be together with you and everyone else who has joined uh zoom today um i should say before i say anything i've always found myself as it relates to religion or faith spirituality to a certain extent one foot in and one foot out i don't know that i've ever been both feet in in either direction I've preferred to kind of um, straddle the fence in some respects because I feel like having one foot in allows me to make changes that need to be changed. Uh, but having one foot out allows me to be critical and to see things from a different perspective that aren't always so easy to see when you are inside the bubble. Uh, and it's easy for us, especially in this day and age of social media where we are, um, where it's easy to, to surround ourselves in our social bubbles and listen from people that only agree with everything that we agree with, believe the way we believe, behave the way we behave. Um, and to realize that it's not even human beings that are putting us in these bubbles any longer, but actually algorithms and, and bots and what have you. So what I what I want to share with you now uh, is it was important to sort of frame it with that, that I come at this as someone who is hypercritical um, of the ways that we have used religion and faith to silo ourselves off in our certainty and uh, sometimes in our rigid dogma and doctrine, and that there is there's more room than we often give credit uh, for us to enter into these conversations where uh, we realize that, and I think, Ruth, you may have been speaking to this at the very beginning as folks were coming on, that there is always more that unites us than divides us. It's always much more sexy to talk about the things that divide us, and those are the things that people dial into, but at the end of the day, it's the things that unite us that make us um, human. So um, I, you know, the question, what holy books or other texts are important to your religion? Dr. Tarson and I were talking about how to sort of approach that, and and one way of looking at that is looking at the texts that really are kind of formative um, and uh, inform our own particular uh, religious tradition. Another really interesting way to look at that is to think of in, 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 in terms of books and other texts outside of maybe your uh, particular religious comfort zone that have informed and shaped your thinking about your own religious tradition. So that may be a topic for another another uh, chat. Uh, for and, and, and I don't presume to speak for Christianity as a whole. In fact, I find that term to be so loaded and full of baggage that uh, I oftentimes don't always use it uh, because it does not have a universal singular meaning. Uh, I'm not sure that it ever did. Uh, I, I certainly feel like in our in our day and age, it is as loaded as it's ever been before. And so um, 
as, as is our approach to the Hebrew scriptures and the books of the New Testament, um, those are formative and authoritative sources for, in my particular uh, tradition, Lutheran Christianity, if you will. And Luther's translation um, of scripture either was the first or among the first that included not only the books of the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament books, but also the apocryphal books, what Luther called these intertestamental books that um, were by many considered so esoteric and mysterious that they weren't quite can canon material to show up in either the Old Testament Hebrew scripture canon or the New Testament scripture. And so Lutherans have, even though Luther seemed to be more open to these books with the exception of first and second Esdras, uh, as they were called, Lutherans have, kept, have, met, have had a sort of interesting ambivalence towards these books of where they exactly fit into, um, into the Hebrew scriptures or the New Testament books. But uh, so I just throw that out there. You know, scripture as we see it and understand it is, is full of many different types of literature, uh, prose, poetry, songs, laments, apocalyptic narrative, letters, epistles, um, and written by imperfect people who were doing their best to capture what seemed most important to them um, and worth passing along to their communities. Uh, which is why it's so interesting to allow scripture to interpret itself. Um, I think I think every faith tradition runs the risk of proof texting, of finding texts that either support a particular position or negate someone else's position. And there's a, there's a lot of danger in doing that uh, as across history we've all fallen um, prey to doing that. And we've seen the sort of disastrous results of what happens when we interpret these these holy these holy scriptures in isolation and divorced from a larger community of people of various faith traditions. And so, the more we have these types of conversations, the more uh, rich and whole I think we um, are humans. So, in addition, in addition to scripture and of, of which Lutherans have a particular lens and frame by which they view scripture. Um, in the United States alone, there are various flavors of Lutheran Christianity, uh, and all of them uh, see scripture in different ways, interpret scripture in different ways, have different filters um, of, of interpreting scripture. Uh, and I'm sure we all have some sense that we're right and others are wrong. Um, I find at the end of the day, those conversations don't tend to be particularly fruitful. Um, we probably each possess something of the truth and the way we approach these texts, these ancient texts, some which feel very, dis very divorced from our current time and others that seem as relevant today as they ever were. And so, but in addition to uh, the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, the New Testament, forming the real substance of our faith and approach to life. Uh, for Lutherans anyway, probably the tour de force was what was a document called the Augsburg Confession. It's interesting that Martin Luther is often the name and the poster child for the Protestant Reformation, but much in the way that the civil rights movement uh, in the United States was only possible because of people working behind the scenes much is true of the way Lutheran Christianity came to be as well. Um, really passionate, committed people who had questions and weren't afraid to ask them to challenge the conventional wisdom of the day, which oftentimes was the Roman Catholic Church, um, who for many of the early Lutheran reformers got a lot right and for other, in other points, uh, didn't. So uh, the Augsburg Confession and then what eventually became the defense or the apology of the Augsburg Confession was a 1530 document where uh, Martin Luther alongside his counterpart, Philip Melanchthon, uh, was asked to give an account to some of the questions that had been posed in what became known as the 95 theses that were nailed to the Wittenberg church door. By the way, we don't have any record uh, specifically of that happening. <laughs> it's just one of those things that has taken on a life of its own. 
um, it was it, it was probably more in keeping that it was nailed to, it, nailed to like a a university professor's door, which was much the way that theses were put forward uh, during Martin Luther's time. But it sure does spin a wonderful story to think of somebody nailing something to a big red church door, and and thus Lutheran churches have oftentimes have red church doors to sort of um, pay homage to what's to something that probably never specifically happened the way that we prefer to think it happened. Um, so this was this the this 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 Augsburg Confession is probably the most well-known confessional document for Lutheran Christians. Um, eventually, all of the important confessional documents of the Lutheran Church, regardless of what flavor of Lutheran you sort of adhere to around the world came to be compiled into what was called the Book of Concord. Um, where I grew up in North Carolina, there was a city called Concord. We called it Concord. When I moved to California, I now have to say Concord to fit in. So the Book of Concord, if you prefer, or if you're from the South, the Book of Concord. Um, in, in the Book of Concord were other documents in addition to the Augsburg Confession and what subsequently came to be known as the, the, the defense of the Augsburg Confession. And they were two documents that probably outside of the Augsburg Confession are the two most well-known documents in Lutheran thought. And they grew out of Martin Luther uh, having a profound recognition that the laity really were rather biblically illiterate and did not understand some of the most primary concepts of church teaching. And so he decided to put together two documents, one called the Small Catechism, which he wrote for the aid of pastors to lead and teach in their congregations. And for families, he wrote a document called the Large Catechism. Uh, these two documents became very popular even outside of Lutheranism and, and other confessional movements as well. Um, a little bit later, 1537, Luther was asked to write a document in preparation for a church council that was to be called, and this document would be presented if it was called. And this this art this document came to be known as the Small Called Articles, named after this tiny little town in Germany of where this council was to take place. And it was presented there, and it took on pretty pretty firmly the subject of the Roman Pope and. Um, Luther was not always so good about learning his lesson about taking on the Roman Pope, but he's kept doing it. Um, after Luther died in 1546, a document was created uh, in response to all the bickering that was happening in the wake of Luther's death about what was really, the, what were the primary teachings of the Lutheran Church. And that came to be known as the Formula of Concord, uh, which was written by a couple of Germans who were trying to bring a sense of unity to this fledgling movement at the time. By the way, Lutheran was, was a term that was coined as a negative sort of slight. It was never meant to be taken positively. Like other, like other groups throughout history, Lutherans claimed this term, uh, sort of reappropriated it, and it became part of who they were. In addition to the formula of Concord, there were more than 50 volumes that were compiled that came to be known as Luther's works. And in those, in Luther's works, uh, of which I saw a set, a complete set be being sold somewhere, I was looking online today, uh, there's something like 69 volumes that contain all of his disputations, all of his sermons, all of his commentaries, and it was going for about $1,700. So if you want to loan me some money, I would love to read these. Um, so all of these, all of these books, all of these works were put together in the Book of Concord, with the exception of Luther's works. A, 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 an item here or there became part of the Book of Concord, um, but all of these other pieces, the Augsburg Confession, the Small Called Articles, um, all the writings um, in response to the power and primacy of the Pope were in there. Martin Luther's small catechism, his large catechism, they all show up in this compilation of books that came to be known as the Book of Concord. Um, I have to confess that I don't, I don't interact with these additional books on a day-to-day -day basis. They're behind me on my bookshelf here somewhere, probably behind two or three levels of books. These were seminary, these were seminary level things that I spent a lot of time learning as much as I could. 
Uh, but like Spanish from high school, I've forgotten a lot of it because um, I just don't interact a lot with it. I find that I spend a lot more of my time engaging with the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament books. Um, and even after 21 years of being a pastor, still find myself surprised when I see something or notice something for the first time that in a text that I've read a hundred times over, it feels like, uh, that just stops me in my tracks and reminds me why I continue to, to uh, engage with these ancient, um, these ancient literatures. Uh, and it, it gets, it still, it still excites me when I do that. Um, just when I think I have, I have preached on a text from every possible angle there is, even to the point of the prodigal son, if you know the story of the prodigal son returning home, you know, there's, there's the perspective of the father, there's the perspective of the son who leaves, there's the perspective of the son who stays. I've preached on those many times. So I think there was one sermon I even preached on the perspective from the fatted calf who was killed to throw a party. So I'm running out of ideas, people, is what I'm saying. Um, no, sometimes in our in our attempts to be novel, what people really want to hear are just the basics. This is why I believe that when people show up to church, if they are not typical, you know, regular churchgoers, they come on Christmas and Easter, and they're not looking for me to be novel. They just want to hear the story of the incarnation and the story of the resurrection. Thank you very much. So, um. That's what I've got today to share with you. Uh, there are plenty of books along the way in my own life that have shaped my understanding of faith and religion and spirituality. Um, and I think the, the, the combination of all those things have contributed to the way I see the world and the way I see others. And it would take a lifetime to try to... Um, elaborate on each of those books that have really impacted me over the years so um yeah so questions thoughts ideas snide remarks let's hear them okay so we'll open it to questions and it looks like ruth gaston has a question yeah i um i'm not sure it's a question but you you talked about how um, you read something in, in one of the ancient books and you, uh, you know, notice it or see it for the first time and it excites you. Could you give us an example of something that you like that? Yeah, I mean, I, so I'm always amazed at the way, I would say a couple years ago, it's it struck me that and at least, at least at the end of the Gospel of Mark, there are a couple of endings. There's a shorter, there's a shorter ending, and then there's a, an, a, an amended ending, which was probably a later edition at some point in time. Because uh, our tendency when we uh, when we're interpreting text, or we're even even scribes who are scribing these texts, there's a tendency to try to make text easier than they actually are. But the shorter ending of Mark ends with. In terms of in terms of the women's response to the resurrection, that they are absolutely terrified. Uh, this is this is this follows after in some of the other gospel versions where women run to the tomb and they come back and it's their male counterparts that literally use the Greek word for shit to say you're full of shit when they come back to announce that the Lord has been you know resurrected or raised from the dead. And so sometimes it takes getting into the original languages as much as I can remember some of that from seminary that just stops me on my track that reminds me how incendiary this information is because there's a tendency in the 21st century to assume that folks in the first century didn't have some of the same struggles and same incred you know sense of incre in in incredible you know this this idea that this was an incredulous story which it still is and it was then and you know, when I read these texts, I'm reminded that, you know, every, you know, people knew that they could count on people staying dead. That's true in the first century and true in the 20, 21st century. So those stories kind of hit me uh, in, in, in upside the head and remind me of, you know, what's at risk uh, of things that you thought you had nailed down uh, and you were certain about turning out not to be as nailed down and as certain as you thought they were. 
which is which is always a cautionary tale for me that just when I think I've boxed something in so that I can control it to some extent, that much like the spirit of God, the Ruach that Dr. Tarson was speaking about, it does not allow itself to be domesticated and it does not allow itself to be controlled and that like the wind blows where it wishes and doesn't ask our permission and to blow in that direction. So um, when I when I feel like the church is stuck and it's entrenched, it's always helpful for me to revisit these texts that kind of blow my world open again um, and oftentimes leave me with more questions than answers. Um, but they also give me hope that the story is still being written and it's still unfolding. Um, my, my challenge, this is kind of to, to underscore um, your question, Ruth, with scripture and our approach to ancient text is trying to figure out how much of what was written, regard, whatever your faith tradition is, that is, that was culturally conditioned and and how to take that and and see if there's some way to extract some sort of core principle from that that is divorced from the social context in which it was written in. Uh, for Chris, for Christians over the centuries, this has been women dress a certain way, women act a certain way, women don't dance, women dress. A, so how much of that is a cultural conditioning and a cultural contextualizing and should be left in the first century versus how many, how many of those cultural conditions should travel with whatever the core principle of that text might be. And who gets to determine what the core principle of that text is to begin with? Who's around the table? Who's been invited? Who's been disinvited or not included? How does that shape where we've arrived today? I, I, I feel like at this point in time in my life, one of the worst things that has happened, at least to Christianity, is that canons were closed. There was this sense that God continues to speak to us, but that it was locked in place in a particular time and that we put the back cover on the book and that was it. So in one hand, we say God still moves and God still speaks. And on the other hand, we say, but it was so it was locked in place uh, the moment we close these canons to say these are the most authoritative books and nothing authoritative can say, be said beyond this. And even if that's what's happening, we've taken these books and we've locked them in, in place. And, and, and because of that, they take on an air of untouchability. And the moment you begin to question or you ask questions about these things and these stories and which ones should travel and which ones shouldn't, um, that opens up Pandora's box. For a lot of folks that are that have seen you know, these, these, these stories be the sort of building blocks of their faith. And so the moment you begin chipping away at these foundations, then all of a sudden it feels as though you're chipping away at someone's faith. Because if you take away enough of these foundational bricks and building blocks, there's a real fear that my entire faith um, construct architecture is going to collapse and what will I be left with? So, I, that's that's a place that interests me. Those types of questions interest me, um, as someone who uh, realizes I know, I know much less than I, you know, care to admit sometimes. But I'm also comforted by the fact that there's so much I don't know, and that especially in in those moments when I I, I don't know something, I always err towards the side of grace. Um, and I firmly believe that every time I draw a line in the sand, that somehow God, whoever, however God is imagined and figured across our religious traditions, is always on the other side of that line. Um, so that's just essentially been my approach. And um, I'm, I'm actually, uh, the older I get, the more content I am with realizing I'm wrong about more things than I ever realized. That actually is comforting to me at this point in time. You know, the, the Jewish religion has um, the ultra-Orthodox um, who believe that everything that's in the Old Testament should be followed exactly. And then there's uh, other groups, like I'm a Reform Jew, and there's conservative Jews, and there's Reconstructionist Jews, and none of them have that belief. And in Israel, the um, 
ultra orthodox is so strong that uh, it's hard for the um, newer religions to be uh, recognized or respected. Yeah. Make yeah. For an interesting dilemma. Yeah. I agree. Looks like we could take one more question if someone else has a question for Pastor John. I guess if no one else has a question, I do, so I'll go ahead and ask. Oh, well, Ramona, you asked you asked a question before. Yeah, just real quickly. Oh, yeah. you know, with all of these different faith traditions, and you know, there Ruth was just explaining about the different um parts of the, the Jewish faith tradition, and you have the Muslim and the Lutheran and the Roman Catholic. Who's right? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I I think that it's a, it's an interesting question, Ramona. I I had a chance of, of of living in India for a little while and having some really honest conversations with my Hindu siblings, and um, all the things that we thought we would be offended by, we weren't actually offended by. To be able to ask some really honest questions, um, even even you know Christianity's thumping kind of thing has been this passage from the Gospel of John that. You know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me except through the Father. And there are other passages like that that have this very exclusive kind of feel to them. I think I think there, there are much better interpretations than often are given with that. But at face value, these texts seem to just um, communicate something very clear that there's, you know, there's there's one way and it's the only way and it's my way. And I think that... I think that we're just wrong. <laughs> um, I think that I can find just as many passages in Scripture that negate that concept. And I think that's why, as I said earlier, Scripture, uh, this is particularly true of the New Testament, has to be allowed to interpret itself. There's a canon within the canon. And so um, I don't know that that always leaves us with easy answers. Uh, I, I don't know what the, the, the right question might be, but I think sometimes it feels like the question who is right maybe just isn't the right question. I can't say that I know what the question is. I just feel like by the moment we frame it that way, then we, we, have, we have committed ourselves down a path that we can't recover from. And it might, in fact, be the right question, Ramona. I don't know. I just know that it always, that question always presents itself in a kind of binary perspective, that there is a right way and there's a wrong way. In my experience, the third way, whatever the third way is, is what is most interesting to me. <laughs> and that just may be where I'm at in my life as a 40-year-old, you know, white, cisgender, affluent, Livermorean. I don't know. Um, but it's that third way that just draws me in okay. that I think is the one that's full of such potential and is so expansive. But I think we so rarely get there because we're not asking the questions that get us there. Um, but I, I, there's there's a there's got to be a third way, and I think there's a lot more than three ways. But <laughs> there's a third way at least, I think. Okay, thank you so much. Yes. Um, thank you to both our speakers, Assad and John.